Next up, I'd like to invite Michelle Wiseman, who's come down from Corvallis tonight to teach us a little bit about cannabis pathogens. Please give her a warm welcome. Right on. Um, thank you so much, Erica. You guys, I have to emphasize how lucky you guys are because I've been going around for like the last year talking to different hydroponic shops, looking for recommendations for pest and pathogen control, specifically for cannabis, because there's not a lot of information out there. And I have to say, Erica is, has been the most knowledgeable person I have met. So you guys are super privileged to have her here in Eugene, and you should definitely utilize her as a resource. So great job, Erica. Yeah. Um, with that being said, I'm extremely happy to be here. Um, just a brief back background. Um, I received my MS in plant pathology in 2013, and I've been studying mycology since 2008. And then since 2013, I've been working as a plant diagnostician. Um, mostly I uh, study fruit pathogens, so I usually deal with grapes and blueberries and apples and um, various crops grown in Oregon. But uh, for about the last year or so, I've been researching cannabis since the legalization. So that way I can reach out and help you guys. So the research I'm presenting here today is kind of what I've been finding over the last year. And I hope it'll be informative for y'all. Oh, okay, we got a double intro slide here. So just a quick overview. Can you guys even see this? This is a problem with this room. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about the disease risk factors in your environment. So environment is a huge role in what diseases you're going to see um, because there are different diseases that are more prevalent indoors versus outdoors. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then lear learning how to recognize plant problems. So learning how to recognize what's a healthy plant versus a diseased or infested plant. And then talking about abiotic and pest problems that resemble disease. And Erica did a good job covering that, so I think I'll just briefly touch on that. And then I'll talk a little bit about the common diseases of cannabis. Um, if you know anything about diseases on cannabis, you know there's a lot. Um, I think there's about 70 different diseases that have been documented thus far. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, folks. We are just now getting into the research, and we're finding new things all the time. So I'm just going to be touching on the most common ones that you're going to see, and then hopefully I'll be able to give you some management recommendations that will allow you to submit your medicine and have it approved and not get like a false flag for um, you know, having that pesticide residue or something like that when you get your testing done. So before I begin, um, I think it's really important, and Erica kind of stressed this, to have kind of a diagnostic toolkit, and that way um, you can quickly diagnose your problem and then manage your disease or you know, nutritional or pest problem. And uh, what goes with the diagnostic toolkit is just having keen observational skills. And so that includes you know, writing down when you apply a pesticide or writing down when you apply a fertilizer and keeping track of that information as well as um, regularly looking at your plants for different signs of disease or um, you know, a nutritional uh, uh, nutrient problems or pest infestations and um, something that can really help you with this like Erica is stressing is definitely a microscope or a hand loop and just like just get to know your plants you know it's really important with all kinds of plants not just your cannabis plants so your tomatoes and your cucumbers or whatever and it'll, it'll just ensure that you have a healthy garden do you have a question no just stretch in all right Cool. Um, and then, of course, yeah, taking notes of your symptoms. Once again, do this in your notebook and have that all in an organized fashion. That way, when you have a problem, you can go back and look at what you've applied and, um, you know, make sure that you've been giving your plants adequate nut nutrition. And that way, you can kind of rule out different possibilities and you can quickly manage whatever problem you may have. Okay. So talking about your disease risk factors. Um, there are different environmental and cultural considerations you need to think about when you're looking at a plant with a problem. Um, first of all, are you growing indoors or outdoors? Like I mentioned, for example, powdery mildew, um, it's more of a problem indoors because you have that confined space where that asexual stage is going to spread very quickly. Whereas outdoors, you may, might see more of like a problem uh, with different root rot pathogens if you're planting in the native soil because that inoculum is present. Um, also, are you using sterile artificial media, so like different potting mixes, or do you 
pasteurize your soil. Um, because if you don't, then, and you're planting in the native soil, we have pythium here, we have fusarium, it's widespread. So that's always going to be a risk factor. Also, do you monitor your pH? This is super important because what might look like a disease problem could actually be a pH issue. If your pH is too low, you might be seeing some kind of like yellowing or, or, or blotchiness on the leaves, and it could just be some kind of nutrient deficiency. So it's really important that you keep your pH within that range. I think cannabis is like between 6.2 and 6.5 is the ideal range. So just pick up a, a pH meter and, and get a nicer one. Honestly, those like stick in things, not very accurate. So talk to Erica. I'm sure she's got some great recommendations on pH meters. Um, also, once again, keeping track of your spray and fertilizer regimens. That way, you know, you know that if you change your sprays and you start seeing symptoms on all of your plants, then maybe you can trace it back to that, strip, that spray. Maybe there is something uh, incompatible with that spray in your plants or there is some kind of contamination in that batch. And then finally, have you stressed your plants recently? So different stressors can inc uh, include like transplanting or if there is like a heat wave or if like your plants dried out. Um, you may see some kind of reaction, and so that's something to keep in mind. So recognizing symptoms, I'm going to cover this really quickly because I think you guys can kind of recognize what is an unhealthy plant. It seems like the cannabis community is like super aware of their plants, and I, I've been really impressed with that, like talking with different growers. Um, so different symptoms you might see, underdevelopment of tissues. So stunting, if you see one strain that's like, you know, not growing as uh, one plant in a particular strain that's not growing as, as tall as the same plant in that, or sorry, a different plant in that same strain, then you might think, well, there's an issue, that one's stunted. Could be a disease problem, could be a nutrient problem. Um, shortened internodes, so those are uh, the, the length in between the branches. So if you start seeing uh, a shortened le length in between those branches, could be a problem. Um, inadequate development of roots, so when you're transplanting, take a look at your roots. Look for browning. If you don't see much development, there could be an indication of a pest or pathogen problem. Malformation of the leaves, like Erica said, this can be attributed to a pest problem, but it could also be a virus. Um, inadequate production of chlorophyll, that can be a wide range of things from nutritional to disease. Oh, too fast. Uh, let's see. Um, different symptoms you might see, overdevelopment of tissues or organs. So um, this can include galls. It's pretty uncommon, but um, we do have the root knot nematode here. So when you're transplanting, if you're doing that, like if you're using the native soil, you might have the root knot nematode. Take a look at your roots. If you see any like galls, like it's kind of hard to see, but like swellings on the roots, that's um, you know a symptom of, of a problem. Most commonly, I see that in carrots. Though. So if you're looking at your carrots and you see that like naughtiness in your carrots, then uh, you probably have some root knot nematodes. Um, other things that you can see, witch's broom. This has just been recently reported. Um, I don't know how prevalent it is in the area, but I thought I would mention it. So if you see like these symptoms, it's kind of hard to see, unfortunately, but th it's like the proliferation of the branches. So you see some kind of unusual like area on your plant where there, you just get all these new branches and they're kind of grouping together. That's what's the witch's broom symptom. And that's a symptom of a phytoplasma. And that was just recently reported in cannabis. So I'd be really curious to know if any of you guys have seen that. You can talk to me afterwards. Um, of course, necrosis. So if you see any kind of browning or wilting, that's an indication of a problem. Um, any kind of leaf spots or mold, that's an indication of a problem, most likely a pathogen. So I briefly touched on this. Just want to emphasize once again, just when you're looking at a plant with a problem, it's best to kind of rule out things before you uh, do treatment options, like kind of like what Erica was saying. So um, one of those things goes with the, taking the pH. So making sure that it's within kind of like, it's like 6.2 to 6.5 is the best range because this is the range where your plant can get, has access to the most nutrients. So the problem is if, you're, if your uh, pH is too low, you'll see like with phosphorus um, that you get like that nutrient lockout. So your, your plant actually can't access those nutrients. So it's really important that it's within that range to just take your pH, you know. Really simple, uh, you know, measures that you can take to keep your plants healthy. 
once again, you know, Erica really covered this, but a lot of like pest problems can look like virus problems. So get your microscope, get your loop out, whatever, look, look for those pests, especially those irified and, and broad mites, the, sorry, the russet mites is the common name. Um, those can oftentimes cause symptoms like kind of this malformation or this distortion of the leaves um, that we're seeing with the broad mite here. Um, that can look like a virus. So if you can look at the leaves and you see those mites, then you can potentially treat it with a pesticide and then rule out viruses as a cause. So moving on, we've, we've ruled out all the different nutrient and pest problems that could be um, attributed to your sick plant. It's most likely you got a pathogen. Um, and there are so many diseases of cannabis, so I'm gonna just touch on a few of the common ones. Lots of seedling diseases out here. Fortunately, if you just take a few uh, precautionary measures, you can help prevent these. Uh, it's called damping off, which essentially means after your seed germinates, uh, some kind of fungus or fungus-like organism gets in there and kills your plant. Just a fancy word. Um, and then there's lots of flower and leaf diseases. Um, mostly going to focus on gray mold or botrytis or blood rot or stem rot, you know, whatever you want to call it. Lots of common names. Powdery mildew. Um, Erica kind of touched on that, so I'll like very briefly tell you some treatment options for that. If you're growing outdoors, there's like a tons of different leaf spots out there. Um, for the most part, these aren't that like economically important. So if you see a leaf spot, there's like several different fungicides or um, biologicals that can be effective, or you can just mechanically remove it and, and a lot of times adequately, ad adequately control the problem. Downy mildew, that can be a problem. I don't think that's super, I haven't talked to many growers that have, maybe they just don't know they have the problem, but I don't know how prevalent that is in our area. Viral and phytoplasma diseases, I'm gonna touch on, it's been kind of like my obsession the last three months, is trying to figure out these viruses, so that's why Erica was like, oh yeah, Michelle will talk to you about it. And then of course, root and stem diseases, I think these are gonna be the most economically important, especially if you're trying to make a living. They can be absolutely devastating. So I'll go ahead and, and kind of focus on those a little bit. Mostly these are gonna be preventative measures. So kind of what Erica was focusing, treat your plants um, like you have a disease. So prevention is key with a lot of these diseases. So just make sure that you have a nice integrative approach. And then you shouldn't have a lot of problems as long as you're taking several different approaches at controlling these pathogens. So damping off, like I said, this is like a fungus or there's a fungus-like organism that essentially attacks your newly emerging seedlings. Um, primarily, these pathogens are, cause, or the, the pathogens are pythium species, which are actually technically oomycetes, but they're traditionally studied by mycologists, so that's why I say they're fungal-like. Um, and then uh, fusarium, which I know like is like a buzzword in this community, it feels like. Um, so that can cause damping off. And then also the gray mold, the Botrytis scenario. Um, so that can cause damping off. It can kill your seedlings um, either before they more emerge um, from the soil or shortly after. And so that can be a problem when it's, you're establishing your plants. Um, along the same lines, a lot of the same pathogens cause root rot. And um, so once again, what we're seeing around here is pythium primarily. And then we also see, uh, so that's gonna be mostly waterborne. It can be present in the soil too. But pythium is mostly a problem in hydroponic systems. Or if you're doing cloning and you have like an aeroponic type deal, um, I, I've definitely, I've had experience it with myself. It's in my own water. So um, pythium is a huge problem if you're gonna be rooting with like, you know, those aeroponic or hydroponic problems. If it's in your system, it can kill all your plants. So um, yeah, I'll go over how to prevent that. And then of course the soil-borne root rot pathogens, there's rhizoctonia, and then the fusarium root rot. The fusarium that's more of a problem is the wilt. So these two pathogens, rhizoctonia and fusarium, um, as far as root rot, root rot goes, it's gonna be more of a problem when your plants are young. So um, usually mature plants, if they're starting to be exposed to rhizoctonia or fusarium, they uh, usually can deal with it, um, unless you stress them out, and in which case then they can become susceptible to even minor pathogens. So um, different root rot and damping off management strategies. Like Erica mentioned, it's good to do have good cultural uh, practices. So using clean materials, and I wanna stress this, 
Um, if you're, especially if you're a commercial grower, or if you're producing clones, um, or if you have a hydroponic system, you know, get, invest in some re reverse osmosis systems, or, you know, heat treat your water, or, you know, find some way so you can clean your water, and that way you don't have that Pythium problem. Um, also, you know, getting clean seeds, so don't use seeds from a diseased plant. I feel like that's common sense. I know some people might tell you that, oh no, you know, it won't, uh, the disease will not migrate into the seed, but let me tell you that's not true for a lot of pathogens. So if you have a mother that's diseased and you're trying to produce seeds, don't use those seeds. Common sense, guys. Um, and then pots. If you're gonna reuse your pots, that's great. It's great for the environment, you know, like we don't need to keep using all that plastic. But it's important to treat them with something like hydrogen peroxide or a dilute bleach solution, so that way you're not getting that inoculum buildup. And then, of course, um, if you really want to avoid root rot pathogens, it's good to use sterile artificial media. And that way, um, you know, it's been pasteurized, and so those Pythium and Fusarium spores, they should be killed. If you do get an infection, um, then it's really important that you promptly remove those infected seedlings so you don't get that inoculum buildup and spreading through your system. Um, also, especially with Botrytis, maintaining good air circulation. So like with those little clone chambers, um, that can be like a really great system for the spreading of disease. So you need to make sure you air those out because otherwise like Botrytis can kind of like r r go rampant in those systems. Um, proper planting, timing, depth, and temperature. So if you're doing uh, seeding, seed planting outside, make sure that the temperature of the soil is correct. I heard this like rule of thumb once where you go outside and you, you know, you throw down your pants and you sit on the soil and if the soil is too cold for your bare ass, it is too cold for your seeds. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and of course there's lots of biological controls out there and they work great. Like Erica said, a lot of times you're gonna have to like supplement with something like yucca extract or some kind of surfactant um, to help, you know, help them stick but um, different active, uh, effective agents, Streptomyces lyticus, um, Streptomyces, like different Streptomyces species, different Trichoderma species. And then actually, Cornell just released a report saying that different vermicompost and liquid vermicompost um, applications can actually be effective at preventing Pythium problems. So that's pretty sweet, like if, especially if you're in the organic uh, movement here, um, so if you're using vermicompost, that might actually be helping suppress those Pythium problems. And then of course, what I think, how I think the industry is gonna kinda go is like how it, it's going with other industries, like the brassica industry. I'm expecting that there's gonna be uh, seed treatments and then seed coating with fungicides and different growth regulators. Um, but something you can do at home if you're having a problem with these damping off pathogens is you can actually soak your seeds and give them a hot water treatment, kind of similar to what Erica was saying. Unfortunately, I have it in Celsius, because um, I'm a scientist and we do everything in Celsius. But um, yeah, so if you soak them at 50 C, and unfortunately, I don't know, I think it's like, I don't know what that is offhand. Maybe it is like right around 120. <laughs> but um, for 30 minutes, and then you plunge it into cold water, that should take care of a lot of those soil, uh, seed borne pathogens. And then the important part there is plunging it into cold water because otherwise you might have a reduced germination rate. Um, of course, there's fungicide seed treatments and then um, there's conventional drenches. Um, fortunately, with these conventional fungicides, by the time you're harvesting, you know, they should not be at detectable levels, but that's something to keep in mind whenever you're using some kind of conventional fungicide, is especially if you're gonna have your medicine tested, that it might, uh, you know, you might have a positive for some uh, pesti pesticide residue. Ooh, the big player here. Who's, who's had bud rot before, or Botrytis scenario? Well, I, I've had it on like my basil, um, and I know it's widespread around here. So what you see with the bud rot is um, browning of the tissue, and um, it spreads super quickly. A lot of times it's like really in the dense bud, so you don't see it at first until it's really kind of spread, which is a problem. Um, so when it, your plants are in flowering, just take a close look at the flowers. If you see any kind of browning areas, remove them promptly, otherwise it's gonna spread quickly. Um, and then under high humidity conditions, you're gonna see sporulation. So you don't always see these gray masses of spores. So don't expect that as like a telltale sign. 
So blood rot, cultural control, that's the most important part here, because if you're getting your stuff tested, you can't apply anything. So it's all about prevention here. Uh, maintain good air circulation. Keep relative humidity below 50%. Um, increase your temperature. Botrytis likes a temperature in between 60 and 68. I know you can't control that if you're outdoors, so if you're outdoors, a lot of times you're going to have to just harvest early if it's a problem. Um, practice good weed control. A lot of these weeds can serve as an alternative host. And uh, you know they can harbor botrytis and then spread to your plants. Promptly remove dead or dying tissue. This is important with a lot of things, with different pest problems, with different pathogens. You know, be clean. If you're just clean, then it's a lot of these things aren't problems. And then um, you know, don't be greedy. Like when your pistols are starting to turn that amber color, it's it's about time to to harvest. When they start turning brown, that's when you start seeing the botrytis problems. You know, that's when your, your, your plants are a lot more susceptible. So you're going to have to harvest early. Otherwise, you're going to see more botrytis bud rot problems. Um, so the biological controls. I have a star here because, like I said, I think this could be a problem with your testing. So if you're submitting your stuff for, to get tested, this might um, trigger a positive uh, in having your colony forming unit count being too high. So um, if you're submitting your stuff to be tested, I do not recommend using any kind of treatment um, in flowering, unfortunately. But if you're not, um, I, and you, aren't, you don't have an immunosuppressed system, then some of these biologicals can be really effective. Once again, the Streptomyces and Trichoderma species can be really effective against Botrytis. And then some really uh, kind of like a new uh, technology, I guess it's not new, I mean, obviously it's been in plants forever, but something that we've been learning about recently is actually this thing called induced systemic resistance. And um, so actually a grower told me about feeding their plant aspirin not too long ago. And I kind of was, I was pretty like bewildered about the whole thing. Like I've never heard of that before. But if you look at the active ingredient in aspirin, it's salicylic acid. And salicylic acid is actually one of the molecules in the signaling pathway when a plant is inducing a defense response. So by applying salicylic acid to your plant, you're kind of like preemptively inducing that defense response. So it actually makes your plants stronger, and it helps them fight off potential pathogens. So that's something to look into. And actually, Cornell's doing some research on this. I can't give specific recommendations, but I, I encourage you to look into it. And then there's also various plant extracts and, uh, on the market that will s induce systemic resistance. One of the products that I know of is Regalia. Unfortunately, there's no efficacy trials out there, so I don't know how effective it is, but they claimed it to be pretty effective. So powdery mildew, I'm just going to briefly touch on this because Erica kind of covered this. Um, I have some examples, by the way, over there, if you guys want to check it out afterwards. But essentially what you're going to see is kind of like these localized lesions here um, that are powdery, so if you touch your plant, you can actually rub it off. And what you're seeing here is actually the asexual stage of the fungus. And this is kind of what it looks like if you look at it underneath a microscope. These are, the fancy word for it is canidia, but essentially it's kind of like a, the, the seed to the fungus. And um, these uh, can be spread very quickly. Um, you know, via your circulating fans. So oftentimes what I see is like one plant <laughs> is the powdery mildew and then the plant directly behind it that the, the fan has been blowing on also has a powdery mildew in like the same location. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, but anyways, the, that's what that looks like. It's not going to kill your plant, but it's definitely going to, um, you know, make it less vigorous. So you want to treat that um, as soon as possible because that can be a, a problem, especially indoors. Um, so similar to botrytis, we're going to maintain good air circulation. When you see diseased tissue, promptly and carefully remove it. Um, and then early harvest when disease pressure is high. Um, what I hear is that a lot of people around here actually harvest when the PM is out. So um, that's a good way to kind of reduce the spread of it for sure. And then if you're indoors, there's also like, you know, you could use the HEPA filters like Erica was saying or you can install a UVC light and that should kill the canidia and prevent them from entering your system. And then something I want to emphasize, especially to like people that are interested in science or, or breeding, is like for all these diseases, I think like the future should be breeding for resistant strains. Like I, I, I mean, if you're like looking to make money, I think like I should emphasize that, um, look into breeding for resistance. And that's what we do for all other vegetables and food crops. 
breeding for disease resistance. Um, chemical control, lots of things are effective against powdery mildew. Catch it early, shouldn't be a problem. Several different oils, um, potassium bicarbonate, sulfur, all those are very effective. Viruses, I'm like going way over my time. <laughs> I'm super passionate about this, so I love talking. Um, there's so, the viruses, this is kind of like an unknown subject with cannabis because there hasn't been much funded research. Um, so what's documented in the peer review literature, the scientific literature, um, is alfalfa mosaic virus, Arabis mosaic virus, cucumber mosaic virus, hemp mosaic virus, hemp streak virus, cannabis cryptic virus. But I wanna emphasize, I know for certain there are other viruses out here. Um, I've been talking with several, several different colleagues who've been kind of working with um, cannabis viruses, and I know that there are a few publications in the works of new viruses that they've discovered, and I think that we actually um, have discovered a new virus too, and we're trying to work on confirming that, but um, you know, you notice something that's missing from this list. Does anybody know what's missing from this list? Nobody wants to say it? Oh, tobacco mosaic virus, thank you. Yeah, that's like a buzzword, I feel like, in this community. Um, as far as I know, in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, tobacco mosaic virus has never been proven to cause symptoms in cannabis. So um, I have seen images online in the forums of people having positive tests, but I actually talked with the Agdea rep, so the uh, company that sells those little immunostrips. You can check them out over there afterwards if you're interested. Um, and she was saying that it wasn't actually tobacco mosaic virus. They did some testing there. It was actually um, a different tobomovirus, so in the same genus, but not TMV. And I actually did some inoculations myself, and I didn't see any symptoms. So I'm um, pretty skeptical on that. I'm not going to include it on that list. So if you see mosaic-like symptoms, I would put money that it's not tobacco mosaic virus. Um, but more likely, you know, looking into uh, maybe cucumber mosaic virus or hemp mosaic virus, or like I said, there are some others that um, there are some publications that are going to be uh, that there's some research going on, and, and there are other mosaic viruses out there. Um, so different viral symptoms you could see, of course, distortion similar to what you see with a pest infestation, like the russet mites, um, thin leaves, mosaic symptoms, um, anything like that. If you can't attribute it to a pest or a nutrient problem, um, and you see potential vectors present, like aphids or um, aerified mites or thrips, you could very likely be dealing with a virus problem. So the unfortunate thing about viruses <laughs> Erica and I use the same picture here, <laughs> um, is that uh, there is no control at this point in time. There has been some research like in developing something kind of like a plant vaccine, but um, it hasn't, we haven't gone really any further into that, but I would expect in the next 20 to 25 years see something like that on the market. Um, but at this point in time, we ha what we have to do is destroy the confirmed plants. So that means laboratory confirmed, not like my buddy on the forum said I have TMB. Um, and I'll, t I'll give you some resources if you want to get your stuff lab confirmed. Um, and then it's really important not to clone or use those seeds because a lot of those viruses can be seed borne. Um, contrary to what High Time says, um, there has been a lot of research on that and it can be seed borne. And then once again, breeding strategy. Um, expecting your clones when you're purchasing them. If you see any kind of mosaic symptoms, don't purchase it. And then something that's interesting and that I'm currently working with somebody and doing some research on is potentially doing um, tissue culture. There's strategies in other industries where they actually heat treat uh, virus infected material and that lowers the titer of the virus and then they'll take the very top, the growing point, and then they'll put it on um, auger that's supplemented with different plant hormones. And then by that way, like by taking that very top growing point, it's called the apical meristem, you actually um, are selecting for tissue that doesn't have the virus, and then you're growing clean material in, in, in vitro. So we're doing uh, research on that. And then of course, controlling your vectors, cleaning your cutters, you know, things like that. Um, and then Fusarium and Verticillium will, Similar controls to root rot, this is all gonna be preventative, but this can be super devastating, so I need to emphasize preventative treatment. You can see this is a, almost a, a mature uh, cannabis plant, probably seven feet tall, and uh, it had fusarium wilt. So, um, you know, that's, 
I don't know, I, I, I don't do them, I don't, I'm not in the, the trade as much, so, but I would imagine that's a few thousand dollars that you just lost there. Um, and then, so when you're looking for it, obviously, what you're gonna see, uh, early symptoms, yellowing of the leaves, lack of vigor, wilting, right? That's what the name's for, wilting. Sometimes this can be the whole plant, sometimes it's one side of the plant. And then if your plant's dead anyways, you might as well cut it open and check it out. What you're gonna see when you cut it open and check it out is kind of like the browning or reddening of the vascular tissue that's indicative of a wilt pathogen. And that's what those look like in case you have a microscope at home. This one's Verticillium dahlia, and that one's Fusarium oxysporum. Um, once again, this is gonna be very similar to the root rot pathogens. So just cultural control using, uh, testing your soil, so you can actually test your soil to see if Verticillium is present. And then um, clean materials, breed for resistant strains, different Streptomyces and Trichodermis species for preventative um, options. And then there are chemical controls that are preventative as well, kind of going back to that induced systemic resistance, regalia, and potentially maybe even aspirin. Um, so additional resources. I'm just one person. I would love to answer all your questions. I super love talking about plants. I'm a huge geek. Um, but I'm super busy too, and I want to give you guys as much help as I can. Um, so one great resource, hemp diseases and pests. That is like the only scientific peer-reviewed literature out there on cannabis pathogens. Um, there are some other ones, and I have an example, but it's not peer-reviewed and there's some errors. So um, hemp diseases and pests, that's my biggest recommendation. Um, OSU has a great website, the PNW Handbook. Um, they have recommendations for other plants. And if you check the ODA list and make sure that you're using approved pesticides, a lot of those things you can kind of uh, bring over to cannabis as well. Testing services. Um, I am doing some testing. It's very part time. And um, you know, it's more of just for exploratory. But if you want to get some testing, I can do some pet testing. But more importantly, there's the ODA, the Oregon Department of Agriculture. They're actually um, doing testing for cannabis. So if you need some help, contact them. And then of course, like I said, Erica is super knowledgeable. They have a microscope there. They can definitely help you out. So check out um, you know, Oregon's Constant Gardener, or um, you know, I have met other hydroponic shops that are knowledgeable, so uh, you can talk to your local hydroponic shop. So thank you, Bethany, for inviting me, Erica, for helping me with all the recommendations. Wes um, provided me some clones so I could kill them. <laughs> Um, at Wild West Growers. And then John McPartland, he's the author of that book that I was talking about. I've been in correspondence with him and uh, Gianpaolo Grassi about those virus pathogens. And like I said, they got something cool in the works. They got some new, uh, new manuscripts coming out about the viruses on cannabis. And then um, Jessica and Mowgli at Phyllis Biosciences, they've been helping hooking me up with people with problems so I could learn more, so I could tell you guys some, more, uh, some cool stuff here. All right, so just some things we didn't cover if you want to look at it while you ask me questions. All right, let's take some questions from the audience. And what a dynamite presentation. Big round of applause. So with these viruses you listed, what, what vectors are they spreading using? Are they airborne or is it all contact based? Good question. So um, he was asked, well, I guess he's got a microphone, so I don't need to repeat it. But um, a lot of the common vectors we see with viruses are aphids. So any kind of sap-sucking insect, aphids, the aerified mites, thrips, um, those are the most common ones. A lot of them are also mechanically transmitted. So say you're taking a clone from one mother and then you don't clean your clippers and you take clones from the other ones, the sap actually on, from that first plant that was infected can infect that second plant. So that can also be an issue. And there are plant um, pathogenic nematodes that can vector viruses as well. Good question. Yeah, plant pathogenic ones. The pa there's, there's beneficials and then there's ones that kill your plants. So it's the ones that kill your plants that aren't good. Um, just a quick question. Uh, if you're using like alfalfa and you don't know that it has mosaic virus, but like you use it for your compost tea to water into your plants, would that transfer it? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I would just recommend making sure that you heat up your compost um, because I don't think there's a lot of research about that, so I don't feel comfortable answering that. But I always recommend when people are uh, composting potentially infected material to make sure that your compost reaches like you know the the amount 
I think it's like 140 or something. So make sure you add lots of nitrogen and heat that pile up so you can kill any potential pathogens there. Other questions from the audience? Ah, yes. I got a quick one as I make my way over. Michelle, have you ever seen uh, Phytophthora in cannabis? Um, so that's a good question. As far as I know, I have not. However, um, hemp, which is in the cannabis, Cannabaceae, same family as cannabis, is susceptible to Phytophthora, and that is currently being debated what particular Phytophthora species. So it's possible it is susceptible, but we just don't have any confirmed cases. Thank you. And I think one more here. Um, one thing is, do you know about the Demeter Association in Philomath, Oregon? <laughs> I'm sorry, there's some noises. Yeah. Can you say that again? Are you familiar with the Demeter Association in Philomath, Oregon? I'm not affiliated with them. No, are you familiar with them? Oh, familiar. I'm not familiar, okay. tell me. Uh, they spoke last month and they apparently are about the only people in the country who can really certify organic because they do use the template of the National Organic Program, the NOP standards, and on top of that, they do the biodynamic standards. I got that clarified when I called them last week after they had been here last month. But uh, I was wondering if you knew about the um, uh, G grapefruit seed extract has been used in agriculture for about 30 years for sucking insects. GSE, it's not grape seed, it's grapefruit seed. Okay. And also, when I was younger, we used to use garlic spray for damp off. And then could you say something about reuse of soil and the OMRI organization based in Eugene. Uh, OMRI is based in Eugene. So um, I think you're asking about the grapefruit seed. Um, I'm not familiar with that, but I'm, what I'm assuming is the active compound is citric acid, and that's been proven to be effective against a lot of different pathogens, and I think even some pests as well. So um, I think that's probably the active compound in those grapefruit seeds. And then I don't remember, what was the other question you had? Uh, reuse of soil. Oh, yeah, so if you're gonna reuse your soil, um, what I would recommend is kind of what the guy last month was talking about with the biodynamic farms, is um, if you're gonna keep reusing the same soil, of course you're gonna encounter inoculum buildup with the pathogens. So I would recommend doing a rotation every three to four years to prevent that inoculum buildup because you're gonna see um, severe decreases in yield if you're gonna have that inoculum buildup. So that's something we need to talk about as a community is like what's good to rotate probably like beans or something, or um, some kind of nitrogen fixing crop with the cannabis. Beautiful, Michelle, thank you so very much. Everybody 